would do work in us this morning. Not only us here, but your church gathered around the world. Father, this morning we want to pray for churches that have already gathered in the East. Father Lord, in particular, wanting to pray for uh, Bangkok Baptist Church there in Bangkok, Thailand. Father Lord, we thank you for uh, the work of this newly planted church. And Father Lord, we pray, Lord, for uh, this young church to be a light in the midst of darkness. We pray, Lord, for this people, Lord, to be bold to declare your glory and excellencies among people who have yet to even hear the gospel. So, Lord, would you do just that this day? Father, Lord, we also want to pray, Lord, for uh, our workers, uh, Lord, who are working still to restore power to those who have yet to, to have it come back. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would be with them, keep them safe, Lord, especially as they work uh, tireless hours. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you will uh, just be with them in that job. Lord, we pray now. Lord, for your work to be done in us. Lord, may your word cut deep in our hearts, exposing sin and our ongoing desperate need of Jesus. And Lord, may we, in return, respond rightly in walking more obediently in light of who Jesus is and what he's done on the cross. God, we pray and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come this morning to Ephesians 4, you're used to me starting with an introduction but in, or of some kind of story. But this morning, I want us to think about what we've learned so far through the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul, and it's broken into two halves. The first half is about what is this new identity Christians have in Jesus? What is this new identity that they are those who have truly been blessed by every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places by God because of their union with Jesus? It's because they are those who have been brought from death to life by their faith in Jesus, this being not a work that they have done, but by God's grace. God's grace has already saved them if they believe in Jesus. But he's not saved them for nothingness. He saved them for good works. Ephesians 2.10. But then who is this new people? Is it the Israelites? No. Is it just the Gentiles? No. It's Jews and Gentiles who have believed in the name of Jesus who have been made the new people of God. That's what Ephesians 3, or the end of chapter 2 began to teach us. Chapter 3, then Paul begins to go into a prayer for these things to play out, for this new identity to, to dwell, but he gets lost. He gets lost in a, a doxological praise of who God is there in 3, 2 through 13. He gets lost in that declaring of this gospel of grace, this mystery that had been hidden for the ages Namely, that one new people are made in Jesus. That this is God's people. And then he finally, in 3.14, begins to pray for these people. To pray that they have understanding, that they grow in strength of power through that of the Holy Spirit. That they actually grow up into their new identity by the power of God himself. The work of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But what then? What do they do with all of this? What do they do with this new identity? Do, th do they just exist and all's well? Or does it require something of them? Well, that's what Ephesians 4 begins to teach us. In Ephesians 4 through 6, we see now, how do we live in light of this new identity in Jesus? Now that We've believed, now that we've been saved, purchased by his blood, what now do we do in light of that hope? If you have a Bible, I invite you there to open up to Ephesians 4 if you've not already. And hear the word of the Lord from Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 1 through verse 16. It says, I therefore 
a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now, you know I like to give a main idea to this, trying to sum up what is Ephesians 4, 1 through 16 saying. And I think the main idea of this text, and Lord willing, if doing this whole preaching thing correctly, the main idea of the sermon is this. The church is to labor for unity, a unity in pursuing Christian maturity together. That's it. And it's there on the screen, but I'm going to repeat it. The church is to labor for unity, a unity in pursuing Christian maturity together. We are to labor for unity, a unity of Christian maturity. We're going to look at this in two points that follow from this. Point one, a unified people. Point two, a maturing people. That's it. Simple, right? Now the hard work. I've got to unfold that for you. But I want us to see the essence of both of these present in this text and should be in our lives. Let's start with verse or point one, a unified people. Verse one, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. We see this word, therefore. I therefore. Paul's making very clearly, if you're an English grammatical nerd, This word, therefore, is important because it's tying it all together. He's showing you what I've been telling you, that Ephesians 1 through 3 has implications. It has serious implications. Therefore, therefore, because of this new identity, therefore, this is how you are called to walk. But notice something else. Notice the language, hopefully, that you heard from me using, but also here that Paul is using Therefore, because of your new identity, now here's how you walk. Or as Paul writes here, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Friend, notice abundantly clear here what these next words are about to teach us is not something that we can naturally do of ourselves. It is not do this in order to earn salvation. It is here, do this in light of that which you have been called, called to believe, that call to faith, what's already been done. Christian, what is about to come here in these next few chapters is a result of our calling in Christ. Let me pause for a moment where I'm going to be hitting buttons all day. 
our calling in Christ is what enables us to walk in these. If you are here and you are wrestling with this Christian faith, if you are wrestling with what does it mean to be a Christian, understand the, the calls that we're about to unfold in that of gentleness, of humility, of patience, of bearing with one another, this call to pursue maturity, you can't do it. You can't do it yet. You never will. The call isn't for you to sit here and learn how to do these and then believe. The call is first for you to believe in Jesus, to trust in him, and then follow. But the first step for you to walk in a manner worthy is to understand the call of Jesus, a call to believe him, a call to come and rest in him, to rest in him alone for salvation. This is the hope of the gospel. This is the invitation that Jesus makes first and foremost to you, the non-believer. Come and believe in Jesus, and then we'll work on the rest. But your first step is to believe in me. That's how you walk worthily. Now, for the rest of us, because we have believed in Jesus, there's implications of that belief. There's implications. Notice what it starts with there in verse 2. We're to walk in a worthy manner there in the end of verse 1, the calling of which we have been called. How? With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's a lot of, of to-dos here, but the primary one resulting here is that of unity, this call to unity. A call to unity in the bonds of the Spirit, the bonds of peace. We're called to unity through the Spirit. Not just any unity. You know, some of you are united because you're, you're Cardinals baseball fans. Some of you are united because you were born and you've grown up and never left Centralia or Central City. Some of you are, are united because you think and like the same things. You know, if, if our unity was based on those, guess what? There can never be unity between me and any of you who are Cardinals fans because I despise the Cardinals. Go Braves! Or even better yet, because I'm married to one, go Cubs! But you see what we base this unity on. We base it on various things and likes and interests. Imagine why there's so much split in the church. Because we, we consume our unity not on the things of the Spirit and the things of Christ. We are more united around the way our building looks, the color of our carpet, the songs we sing, the way we do things, a women's Bible study instead of the primary things of God. Not all of these are wrong, but if our unity is based on those and those alone, we've missed the unity God is calling us to. It's a unity of spirit, a unity of oneness in foundational belief. Believing the essential things. Well, let me put it this way. Going off here what the, Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul is alluding to. Imagine if our unity is like our God was. If our unity was just kind of all, all of a sudden split constantly over different things. Would our God not be split? But notice how, how Paul drives this unity to, to essence for us to see the essentialness of it in the Christian life, in the local church especially. Notice what he says beginning in verse 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Christian, why is unity so important? It's not just because a pastor likes to get up here and talk about unity for unity's sake. Just so he can keep a people united and get a paycheck from it. The call to unity, to Christian unity, is based on the oneness of a triune God. Now, if you are a new Christian or wrestling with Christianity, maybe, maybe that statement alone just confused you. Oneness of a triune God. Let me start with the great Shema. 
from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4. Deuteronomy 6, 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There is but one God. The great Shema was the first thing Jews would have learned of the law of God, that there is but one God, Yahweh. I am. But he exists in three persons. The Bible teaches us, though the Bible never uses the language of triune or trinity, it teaches of Father, Son, and Spirit, all three existing as one God. Three distinct persons, one God. I love how the Westminster Shorter Catechism helps us to sum this idea up. In the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question six, it asks, how many persons are there in the Godhead? The answer, there are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one God, the same in substance, equal in power and glory. The Father, Son, and Spirit are equal in power and glory but they are one god working together and why i emphasize this here is because we see this even as as paul drives home this oneness this unity within the triune god the father doesn't work against the son and the father and son don't work against the spirit they work together there's this oneness But notice how Paul uses this to drive home his point to call us to Christian unity. Verse 4 again. There is one body and one spirit. There are not two spirits. There is one spirit out of the Holy Spirit. There's Father, Son, and Spirit. There's one body, one church, the universal church, who holds to the same faith and baptism. The same essential core Christian doctrine. The church is to hold to this one faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. Now, of course, we know as being a Southern Baptist church, there are plenty of denominations. There are plenty of splits throughout church history. So so why? Why did this all go about? Well, let, let me go into a history lesson here. The Reformation, the Protestant church, began out of protest. Protest not to split, but to reform within the Holy Catholic Church. It did not start out of wanting to divide for division's sake. It wanted to reform. Martin Luther, as he made his stand in Wittenberg, as he made his stand and saying, on this I stand. The scriptures must convince me otherwise. He stood his ground. And of course, then the split began. But it was the idea was to reform to the one essence of true faith. It was not to the Pope's authority and the changing of the church. It was to hold fast to the Lord Jesus and him alone. To hold to the teachings given in the Bible. That's why Luther and those who followed in his footsteps have been so, so instrumental in making sure God's word got out in the language of God's people. Have you ever wondered why there are so many translations? Why I have an ESV, why the NIVs and the pews, why some of you have a different translation? It's to make sure God's word is communicated in ways that we can understand in plain language in our different degrees of learning so that we can understand this but the idea was always one one spirit one faith one baptism there is not many there is one hope in the lord jesus christ there is but the one hope in him it's not have we done enough can we be saved it's the one hope in the one lord jesus christ Hope that in Christ, the sins of the world are taken away. And that in Him, by faith in Him, we can be made, from, brought from death to life. This is the one faith, the one hope. And because of that, 
It's to drive unity within the church. The universal, but in particular, even the local church. Christian, do you understand that these core elements of Christianity are what are to bind us together? They're to drive our laboring for unity, our maintaining of this unity. It's not everything we make unity about. A church is not truly united if it's about the, the way the building goes. Think of how many church business meetings have gone south because the color of the carpet was being voted to be changed, or windows, whether they should stay that uh, of the stained glass or changed for more practical reasons. We put our unity around everything else but this one core doctrine of the gospel. And because this oneness, this oneness of the Spirit, one body, this, but notice how the language continues, one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. There is not multiple fathers, but there is one who stands over it all. Because of this oneness in the triune God, as Father, Son, and Spirit are all referenced here in these three verses, it's to drive our unity our unity as the church. Unity is not optional. It is foundational to right living in the Christian faith. Friend, this means if you're here and you're not a member of a local church, we're glad you're here. We're not going to love you any less, but you need to hear the strong call that you cannot be someone who labors to maintain unity apart from being joined to a local church. You say, but wait, I'm part of the universal church. Well, yes, that's true. But how do you love people when it's hard if you are not united to them in practical, close living? It's easy to say, I love those that I barely spend time with and can say, yep, but I get to go be away for the next year. I don't have to see you again until next Christmas, spend time with you. Great. How do you, are you united in one faith with them if you're not living it out practically? Unity is lived out in the local church. There's no such thing as a biblical Christian apart from biblical church membership. Make membership matter. But not just that. Notice how that membership's to matter, how that membership and love is to be carried out. Let's return to verse 2. How does this unity maintain? Verse 2. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, Bearing with one another in love. We're to maintain the unity of the church, the unity of our faith with hum all humility, gentleness, with patience, and bearing with one another in love. But let me back up a step. Notice the language, eager to maintain, or laboring to maintain unity. The unity we have is not something we create. We don't create unity when Central City Baptist Church formed in 1890, if I got that right. We, we did not create unity in that moment. Unity is given through our one faith, one hope, one baptism, one spirit in Christ. But our job is to maintain it, to labor eagerly to maintain that through this humility and gentleness with patience bearing with one another in love. But notice the language here of humility and gentleness. The, these two are, are separate, distinct, but they go together. The very fact that it says to be gentle, or all humility. Think about it this way. What does the world tell us that we should be? We should be a proud people. A proud people, a proud individual. What's a strong man, as I asked the men in Sunday school this morning? What is a strong man? What does the world say a strong man is? One who's proud and does not ask for help. One who's strong, doesn't show emotion. That's how the world defines manhood. But notice what it says, with all humility is how we walk in a manner worthy. Why is Humility is so essential. Well, one for the Lord Jesus Christ himself was described in this way. In Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 and 30, it says, Come to him, 
and rest in him who is gentle and lowly in heart. Well, that's for one to imitate Jesus. But think about it this way. The, the opposite then of humility is this pride, and pride insists on its own way. It demands its own way. Unity can't happen where pride flourishes. Where everyone is pursuing that of their own self-interest, unity cannot happen. The way to work against that pride is to labor to walk with all humility. To wait, labor where you humble yourself and others' preferences are more important or as important as your own. Christian, brother, sister, when's the last time you've set aside your own preference for the sake of another? When is the last time you have set aside your own personal pride for the sake of building up the body in unity? Kill pride and walk in humility. That's part of the formula to unity within the local church. A church that humbles themselves together, looking out for one another. I love how John Stott even draws this and, and I'm, I'm going to drive this home thought with this. He, John Stott in his commentary writes, Pride lurks behind all discord, while the greatest single secret of concord is humility. Every divisiveness, pride is lurking. Every disunity, pride is there. Let us be a people who humble themselves. Let us be a people who humble themselves because the humble are actually teachable. Do you understand, Christian, that if you're prideful thinking you already know it all, you don't submit to the teaching of God's word. You don't bring yourself regularly under it. You think you've already got it figured out, and therefore there's nothing left for you to learn. Therefore you rush through your Bible reading without saying, what is this saying of me? Or if you're prideful, it's always them out there, not us. You see how pride destroys. We need to be a people in humility because that's the only way we'll mature. But not just humility, with gentleness. Again, the opposite of gentleness is harshness, brassness. It's firmness. You know, again, uh, going back to uh, what is it defines a strong man. A strong man is seen as one who's firm and hardened. One that doesn't show emotion. This, this, this is a strong man. At least that's the way the world paints it. But notice, again, it calls us to gentleness. Gentleness is not weakness. Don't misconstrue what gentleness is. Gentleness is not a call to weakness. Gentleness is called to a, a power only through the spirit of actually being in control. You think about it. What sets people off? What causes them to be enraged and to show their harshness? Is it not their anger and they lose control of self, lose control of tongue and mind? The gentleness here calls for us to actually be using self-control, self-restraint. How do we preserve unity? How do we maintain unity? By being a people in control, showing self restraint with one another even that most difficult church member and most difficult person there is self-control is needed to show gentleness god help us myself included in that but notice how it goes on with patience bearing with one another in love these two go together and work in tandem patience is long bearing long suffering patience in the midst of it, not begrudging patience. Christian, do you understand that for unity's sake, we have to be patient with one another? We have to bear with one another? Think about it. Why, why is it as Christians we expect so often for each other to get it right immediately when yet we would ask for grace in return from one another? but we demand and expect that same grace from the Lord when we screw up. Have we not yet learned it takes time? Yes, the moment we come to faith in Jesus, we are immediately justified, declared righteous in Christ. 
but we're not yet sanctified. We're not yet perfect in glorification. We're still being made right. We're still being more and more conformed to the image of Jesus, which we're going to continue looking at for the next few weeks. But as we're being made and conformed to the image of Jesus, we need to show patience with one another and to bear with one another, to hold each other up and strengthen and encourage one another along the way because it's going to be slow and tedious, not just for you, but for others around you too. But we don't do this begrudgingly. We do this in love. To have unity is to bear with one another in love. Do we see the people around us in the local church and say, we love them as Christ has loved us. We want to actually bear with them as they grow up into maturity, as they grow in Christ-likeness. Do we want to bear with them along the way and maintain our unity in pursuit of the same goal? What? That is the unity of the Spirit. We're all working towards that kind of unity. Brothers and sisters, let us see this great and urgent call to unity and pursue it with all that we have. Let's labor diligently for this kind of biblical unity. But again, not just any unity. A unity of spirit that is working towards maturity. And that brings us to our second point this morning, a maturing people. Look at verse 7. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Paul has just called us to unity. But then he turns here in verse 7 towards these various gifts that Christ gives by his grace, gifts to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. In the body of Christ, there are a variety of different giftings. Christ has gifted every Christian in different ways and in different levels. Not all of us are called to get up here on Sunday morning and preach. Not all of us are called to work in children's ministry. Not all of us are called and gifted in the same way to do the same task. Not all of us are called and gifted to do mercy ministry the same way or the same degree of interest. God gifts his church and his people in different ways. Consider the way that the Bible talks about these different gifts. In Romans 12, there's a variety of different gifts given. Gifts of prophecy, of service, of teaching, of generosity, of leading, of zeal, of mercy, of cheerfulness. Gifts of tongues in 1 Corinthians is prominent. Verse 11 here of our own chapter in Ephesians 4, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. Different members are div- gifted in a diverse ways and diverse levels. What for? Well, ultimately for the equipping of the saints, for the maturing of the entire body as it's built together. All of these giftings are meant to be used, but before we can go there, we must do what with the Apostle Paul and and get sidetracked here in verses 8 through 10. Notice what it says. Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. These gifts that the Apostle Paul is referring to, he ties back to our scripture reading in Psalm 68 from earlier in the service. But again, notice what it said there in that scripture reading. You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious. But that's not what we see here in Ephesians 4, 8. When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Okay, Paul, did you just misquote Psalm 68 intentionally or carelessly? Did you just get it wrong, Paul? No, Paul did not get this wrong. Paul understood what happens when armies conquer and kings conquer enemy territories. Spoils are had. Spoils are gained. And those spoils are spread out, especially in the history 
of ancient Israel. How many times did the men say, we will hold the spoil for those that went out? But correct me if I'm wrong, was it not David who said, no, all will share in the spoil, even those that stayed behind? The spoils were shared and given from the victory. So as God ascends on high, ultimately referring to Christ, having descended first, whether that dissension be referring to his dissension from heaven to earth in humanity and living and dying on a cross, or his dissension being that descending into hell, which both take place. One thing's certain, and, and Paul's focusing here, he's ascended. He didn't just descend, he has ascended. He's ascended above the heavens and seated next to the right hand of God. He has conquered that of sin and death on the cross. And therefore, he's had victory over them. He's had victory over every part that sin has affected of this world. He has calmed the seas. He has healed the body of sickness. He has done all of these works showing that he is the only one to restore humanity to what it was in its good creation. And therefore, now with his ascension, he gives that spoil to his people to use, to labor, to unite them to God, and to be mature. That's what these giftings that he gives to his church are all about. He gives them as part of his spoil in order to work for his people to grow in maturity. That's what it mean, why Paul did this. And then he returns to this thought of these various gifts in verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. What? to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. The giftings are meant to build the body of Christ. And it starts with his word. Notice these different offices in verse 11, apostles and prophets. Both of these are offices that in the day Paul wrote this in to the church of uh, Ephesus, these offices existed, but they don't anymore. That of the apostles and prophets were offices that were given by God before the canon of Scripture was sealed and closed. Apostle, to be an apostle, you had to be a male chosen by Jesus who visibly saw him in his life and ministry and saw his death and resurrection. That's why lots were cast for two different ones and Acts 2 to choose one to replace Judas. And of course, the Apostle Paul was added as one of those apostles who had authority. But even Paul recognized himself as the least of these apostles. So there are no new apostles today. Same with prophets. They were the ones who heard God speak and gave it directly to the people. But now that God's word and canon is closed in that of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, there is no new revelation the Spirit comes and is given to help illumine what has been given, but there is no revelation. Apostles and prophets are no more, but we stand upon the shoulders and the foundation of the apostles and prophets as the local church. Even reading the word this morning is standing on their shoulders, holding to the teaching of God's word. God's word builds his church up. That's why the evangelist is next mentioned. The evangelist is is what we would say are modern-day missionaries who, who go to places that have yet to be reached with the gospel. They take and go on the front lines proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. These are the evangelists it's talking about. It, it, yes, it, there's confusion often here. Okay, he gives evangelists. Maybe, maybe I'm not called to evangelize, be evangelist, so I don't evangelize. Christian, I hate to tell you, this isn't your way to get out of personal evangelism. It's talking about a specific office of evangelists. We're not all called to pack up our things and go overseas. I wish more of us were. I wish more of us would receive that call even in retirement. People go to the ends of the earth and take the gospel to the nations. But this office doesn't say that we don't evangelize where we're at. It doesn't say that because there's a special office of evangelists that we can get away from it. 
We're still all called to declare the excellencies of Christ. That's why the church is being built up so that we all do the work of ministry. Because it's our job as the body of Christ to do the work of ministry. And that includes personal evangelism of sharing the faith with others so that they may hear and believe. But again, the evangelists go. They declare the word where it has yet been declared. And then likewise, that of shepherds, of teachers. These two go together. They're similar, but they're not the same. Not every teacher is called a shepherd, but every shepherd better be a teacher of God's word. Shepherds are that of pastor, of elder. They're ones who have been qualified for this office to teach God's word to build God's church with God's word, to build upon that foundation, that ongoing foundation of the apostles and prophets. But teachers are those that are teaching God's word in Sunday school and children's ministry, that are teaching God's word in one-on-one -on -one meetings with different individuals who are teaching God's word in just life circumstances. God has given every one of these. Christ has gifted these for a purpose, for building and teaching his church for building them up on the foundation of God's word why to equip God's people the church for the work of ministry Christian do you understand that part of being a member is not a call to laziness it's not a call to sit and watch others do it's a call for the whole body to be doing the call for the body of Christ to be doing the ministry of the church. Churches die when they depend upon one person to do all a ministry. When churches are built on a personality of a pastor, they go to die because the body is not being equipped to do the work of ministry. The body is not being equipped to go and be mobilized around the world. Some of you who love to chit-chat and don't tell me there's not many of you because some of you, when you get to talking and conversations, you go on and on. You like to talk. I don't say that as a bad thing. But why, why do you stop talking to non-Christians? How about going and using that love to gab and chat to be intentional in striking conversations with somebody who's yet to hear? Or striking somebody who's struggling in loneliness and feels disengaged and chat with them and say, brother, sister, I know you've been absent. How are you doing? Let's chat. Let's catch up on life. Be intentional in that. That's how the body is equipped and does the work of ministry. Let us be all laboring for this too until we attain, there in verse 13, attain the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The body of Christ is to be growing and being equipped and maturing as the people of God. Christian, there is no room for us to say we're okay with being immature in our Christian faith. There's no room for us to say we're okay with where we're at and don't want to be challenged to grow. Some of us don't like to be challenged. And that's a sign of immaturity. Maturity says, I know I need pressed. I know I need to grow. For the educators, you know part of what that means. To press because you see the potential of growth. Well, Christian, guess what? We're all to grow because the same power that has saved us is the same power that it is calling to work in us and to mature us to this. Why? Verse 14. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. In our immaturity, we're carried off into every latest fad of Christianity. There's a lot of fads going on in our day. If you do this, you're going to be successful and grow. If you have the right kind of music that appeals to the youngsters, you're going to grow your church. 
when some in this church asked me about that and that we should do that, my answer was, what you win them with is what you're going to keep them with. And that trend will change. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel is what we must do and grow to maturity until the whole people of God are maturing and growing in Christ's likeness. Because only then are we being built on the right foundation and the thing unifying us is this truth of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, let us grow and help each other because too many are being tossed about by every cunning thing there is, every fad there is in saying this is what we need to put our attention to. No, maturity is standing in this gospel and growing and flourishing as we're built into Jesus. It's not my words. Look, look what it says here in 15 and 16. Rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, with, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Christian, we labor for unity for the sake of maturity. Because guess what? Think about it this way. It, it, for those who have worked out, let me use one illustration, and then for the rest, I'll use another. Think about the benefit of working out with a bench, with a bar, rather than dumbbells. The temptation with dumbbells is maybe I'll use a little less weight on my weaker side so I can look strong with my right side. Or maybe I'll, I'll only lift one side up and the other will kind of be here shaking. One part of you is growing, the other is not. Why do we do the same thing in the body of Christ? Where one member's growing, but others aren't. The whole body can't be strong if, if all the members aren't growing together. I told you, you use a, an illustration that all of us hopefully can. Think about the weakest member of your family. Or the strongest member of your family. If one part's not growing, the whole family's not growing strong. They're being held back by the one who's remaining behind. You don't give up on them, do you? No, you encourage them. You, you want to see them grow. The same must be true of the body of Christ in the local church, of us laboring together to grow together in that maturity. For us all calling one another to rise up, to set the bar higher so that we can grow in Christ, to grow in this Christian maturity. Why? One, because this is the command of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's given gifts of his people for the purpose of building up the body to rise to this unity of faith in Jesus. But we do it out of love for one another. If we truly say we love one another, we cannot let each other stay idle and immature, but we're going to labor to press one another onward in the Christian faith to the maturity of that faith. Brothers and sisters, we labor for this kind of unity and this kind of maturity in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your grace to us in Jesus. Father, we pray, Lord, that you will give us the ability to labor, to build up the body of Christ to this kind of maturity. Help us to have wisdom in how to uh, further humble ourselves and to uh, be gentle with one another and patient with one another, O oh God. Help us in these ways so that we may grow in Christ and unity in him. God, we ask this in Jesus' name.